Okay, welcome back after the break. Uh, just before we went for the break, we were looking at God's government, his authority structure that he has placed um, in the family and in the local church. So we had a question about, um, you know, men being um, too bossy, you know. Basically, uh, it's different, depends on the culture that we come from, the cultural upbringing. So if you look at it in an Indian context, you know, sons are like treated like kings and uh, prince and, you know, they are treated to rule uh, over, you know, everyone around them. So it's just the cultural upbringing also can have a factor that plays in the psychology and in the mindset of um, men. And also that's been our culture. But if you go outside India, we don't see that in, in some countries where there is, they see equality, they see they are, you know, they equal rights to men and women, even with husband and wife, we see, you know, men not being too bossy and lording over them. Also, we can, uh, we can look at it also as how God has made them, wired them, you know, in one sense, yes, they are, they have that, you know, innate in them that, you know, that they are to be leaders, they are to take on responsibility. And um, it can also be like personality types that they uh, have. Um, uh, and the other thing can be is because in, if you look at it, in the Christian circles, uh, this is not taught from the pulpit. You know, and also looking at uh, pastors and leaders, they also act to bossy and uh, lord over people. So it just flows down through uh, the people. Anointing flows down like that. It flows down to people. So it's not that it's also that because of cultural upbringing, they are not, you know, they don't teach this in, in church. And also scriptures are misinterpreted. They're not interpreted in context, in understanding. So that can be another reason. But if uh, men really read the scripture, the Holy S and the Holy Spirit leads them, speaks to them, they're willing, they're open uh, to um, obe be obedient to what scripture says and follow that, you know, it is good. Um, it is a blessing to them and to their family as well. So that is why we're talking about this and teaching it. And so it's important for you all to also, even as you're learning this, to teach it to others. But when it comes to women who are not submissive, again, it can be because of the upbringing that um, they have. You know, they would have seen their mothers or somebody in their family uh, like that who has not been very submissive or they have been brought up saying that men and women are equal rights or, you know, some of the courses that people take also, you know, uh, <laughs> basically they go to, um, you know, where it is, has to do with, um, um, uh, you know, community development and all women empowering and all of those things. Even in the Christian circles, when it comes to uh, feminist theology, women's theology, all of that that empowers women, you know, you are to be head, you are co-equal with men and all of those things. All of those things are good in one in, in one sense, but also we need to go back to what the Bible says and says, it says we need to submit again. Uh, because of all this feminist theology that has come about, uh, you know, uh, feminist activists that stand up and say, hey, you have to speak up for your rights. And women who are abused, who think that, you know, the abuse is enough. We cannot tolerate this anymore. I have to be bold and strong. So they go to another extreme where, you know, they can uh, be overpowering and overruling. Or maybe also because of culture where they have seen them mothers being abused and they think that you know I shouldn't uh, allow that because then this man is going to abuse me because my mother was very submissive I shouldn't be a uh, submissive I have equal rights or it comes to pride you know because uh, women are now uh, well educated you know I have my own rights I'm earning so I can do what I want so all of that is in one sense okay but we need to come back again to what the bible says and we need to learn that we need to submit um out of love and reverence for christ that why should we submit to our husbands not just because uh, you know i have to but it's out of reverence for christ whatever i'm doing i'm doing for christ whether i'm working laboring working in a uh, you know a, a, in a firm or doing some menial job or a big job i do it everything as unto the Lord. So even submission is as unto the um, Lord. So, 
you know, um, in that context and also should be taught from the pulpit, should be taught from the church and people should be given the right uh, teaching in the right way. Instead of saying, hey, women, you have to be submissive, women will not accept that. But you need to give them why they need to be submissive. For example, even for children, we need to tell them, you know, uh, when we're teaching them about commandments and laws and rules, uh, you know, you have to follow rules and regulations. And they'll say, hey, we don't want to be fed up of following rules and regulations. But if you tell them, why did God place rules and regulations? It's for our benefit, it's for us to be blessed so that we don't get up get into any problems or difficulties so we don't land up into any mess that is why god has put rules and boundaries so that we don't mess up our lives so that our lives so if you get children to see the whole picture like that we get men and women to see the whole picture then it works in their psychic they works in their mind and they would want to do it. rather than just saying hey you have to do it because the bible says why does the bible say it I mean, even if God says you submit to your husband, that he has something there, something for our benefit, something for our uh, good. Okay. Anyone wants to add to that what I said? This is a big topic. We can go on. Okay. Sri Radha says when an elder is working before a youth, people sometimes tell the youth they don't have manners. So, Pastor, what to tell in such situations which will not offend them? Um, yeah, I think you can just say that, uh, you know, I offered to help, but uh, the uh, the elder person said that they would like to do it themselves. They're quite capable of doing it themselves. They don't need any help. Uh, so I'm just waiting to see if they need any help. I can um, reach out to them. So you can put it at that way. So or you can say, you know, I offered to help, but they didn't want to help. But I'm waiting in case they need help. Or if, you know, they're not able to manage, I'm here to help them. So they know that, hey, you're there to help, you're standing back and just watching when they are, you know, really need help or they're falling apart or they're not able to do it. You're there to uh, uh, pitch in and help and uh, offer that needed help. I hope it answered your questions. Yes? No? No, Nina? Santosh? Oh, yes, yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So we'll uh, move on. Um, uh, God's government structure uh, is there even in the body of Christ. So we looked at the local church, but we're looking at the body of Christ, which means all the local churches put together in a city. Okay, all the local churches put together in a town, or all the local churches put together in a country or a nation means the body of Christ. Okay, so let's look at First uh, Corinthians chapter twelve, verse twenty-eight. Can somebody read that, please? First Corinthians chapter twelve, verse twenty-eight. And God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. Amen. So here it says, in the body of Christ, you know, there is God has given, put a government, there is a God's authority. Okay. So he says that first are whom? Apostles are first. Okay. They're not first because they are superior to others, but first in order, first in time, and first in rank. Not in superiority, okay? That means doesn't mean that apostles are superior to prophets and to uh, uh, prophets are, uh, and apostles are superior to teachers. And uh, apostles, prophets, and teachers are superior to miracles uh, workers. No, it does not mean superiority, but it means first in order. First in time and first in rank. Okay. First in order, time and rank of the government that God has established in the body of Christ. And it does not mean that they are superior to others. Okay. But they, they are first in terms of God's government in the body of Christ. Christ. And then he says, there are prophets, there are teachers, there are miracle workers, there are gifts of healings, and those who help in administration. Okay. So through all of these different um, ministry appointments or responsibilities, God's government comes in and through the body of Christ. Okay. So what does the uh, Bible teach us about God's government or authority in the body of Christ? The Bible teaches us that we need to give honor to those who are in these positions of 
leadership, not because they are better than us, not because they are superior to us, but at the end of the day, we are all co-equal, we are all equal together in the body of Christ, but we give them honor because of the government, because of the structure that God has placed, and because through that structure, God's government comes in and through our lives, okay? And so for those in positions of leadership, in these structures of authority or in this government that God has placed, it's not for them to be pompous and going around and saying, hey, I'm Apostle uh, Jones or I'm Apostle, um, uh, what's his name? Um, Francis, I'm I'm a Prophet Smith or I'm Prophet Prince or I'm Prophet uh, Rin or, you know, uh, uh, Prophet Nina. You know, you don't go around. It's abusing that position. It's not why God has put them there to be pompous and to be you know show off and to just you know talk about who they are but why did god put them there look at ephesians chapter 4 verses 11 and 12 can somebody read that please ephesians chapter 4 verses 11 and 12. and he himself gave some to be apostles some prophets some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry for the edifying of the body of christ Amen. So here it clearly tells us why God put these ministry offices in the body of Christ. Why did he put these ministry offices? For the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry and edifying the body of Christ. So the, the two responsibilities that these people in these ministry offices have to do. The first one is they have to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. So you know, you and I as people, you as people are, you know, must receive these equipping, you know, that you need for the ministry that God has placed for your life. Okay. So in God's kingdom, who are the ministers? The people are the ministers. It's not the pastors. Sometimes we think the pastors are the ministers. Pastors are not the ministers. Pastors are the equippers they are the one who is to equip and you are the ministers of god you are the ones who are going to do the ministry the part the ministry of the pastor the teacher the prophet the apostle is to equip the saints for the so that they can do the ministry okay so we always think the pastors and all of these people are to do the ministry no their role is to equip the people and it's the people who go out and do the ministry okay that's the first thing the second thing is for the edifying of the body of christ meaning that you know the body of christ must be built up the body of christ must be edified in spirit they must grow in numbers growth in all dimensions and they must be built up okay so that is the responsibility of those uh, in the government office of an apostle a prophet a pastor a teacher an evangelist and they have to carry out this responsibility it's not their responsibility to abuse their position but rather to fulfill what god has called them to do to equip the saints and to edify the body of christ in the lives of the people or in the lives of the people in the church okay so that is god's government his structure in the body of um, of Christ, okay, in all the local churches put together in the body of Christ. Any questions? Any questions, online students? Okay, uh, no questions, and we'll move on. God's government also, yeah. Uh, Pastor, like when you said about, um, like, we, the body of Christ, like, we should be ministering. Uh, do the ministry. Uh, what do you mean by that? And the pastor not doing the ministry. Yeah, the pastor is doing the ministry of equipping the saints, of uh, of um, you know of um, ministering, of uh, edifying them in the in the spirit, of uh, equipping the saints. Okay, so they are to equip the saints for the work of ministry and edify the body of Christ. So that is their ministry. So when you're talking about ministry, it means going out about and preaching and teaching the good news of the kingdom of God is the people who need to also do that ministry. It's not just the pastor and these those who are called to these ministry offices. 
Yes. Okay. Uh, then we'll move on to God's government in the workplace. Okay. Many of you who are online students and uh, those who are um, uh, e-learning students, you are also working uh, professionals. So, you know, um, you know, many of you are have bosses over you, uh, have managers over you, uh, or some of you also are in places of authority where you yourself are, uh, you know, an authoritative figure. You yourself are a boss or a manager, and there are people working for you, people reporting for you. And um, we need to know how we, you know, uh, how God's government. Uh, flows into the workplace or what is God's governmental structure that comes into the workplace. Okay, so let's look at Ephesians chapter 6 verses 5 to 9. Can somebody read that please? Bond servants, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling in sincerity of heart as to Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. And you, masters, do the same things to them, giving up threatening, knowing that your own master also is in heaven and there is no partiality with him. Amen. So, um, you know, this is God's government coming into the workplace. It says, you know, here it talks about bond servants, but we can look at it as employees, okay, and masters as the employers, okay. So it says, you know, as employees, you know, uh, we all have bosses, but here it does not qualify what kind of bosses. It does not categorize the kind of bosses. It does not say good boss, bad boss, medium boss. It just says you all have a boss or a, or an employer or a uh, somebody who is your master okay so uh and you are working for them regardless of who your boss is what kind of attitude mindset how he's treating you what is your responsibility you have to work as an employee of christ okay and whatever you do do with all your heart not pleasing men, but doing it as unto the Lord. So if you relate to this authority structure that God has placed for you in the workplace, if you're following this, then God's blessing will flow in and through your life. You will see, even if the boss tries to stop your promotion, tries to stop your increase, whatever, he cannot do it because when God works, no man can stop him. Okay, so but what do we need to do? We need to relate correctly to the authority structure. Yes, sometimes, you know, our bosses can be very difficult, can be rude. We want to show them the other side. We want to show them what we can do in, 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 uh, in return. But if we are submissive, if we do what is required of us, honor them, respect them, treat them with respect, not stab them behind their backs, not gossip about them. But, you know, uh, we work as unto the Lord, doing everything that we're doing as unto the Lord. Then we are correctly placing and positioning ourselves in God's authority structure, his government is at the workplace. And we, when we do that, God himself, will bring the blessings into our lives okay now for those who are in places of authority those who are employers what does the word of God say how does God want or the scripture want us to treat people we should not threaten them right you know why shouldn't we threaten them because we have our own master at the end of the day at the end of the day you are also reporting to a master and who is that master Somebody who sits above, okay, and somebody who does not show partiality among people, okay. So this is the government structure that God has placed at the workplace, and this is what we need to do even as we work at the workplace. Any questions about this? Before we move on to the last authority structure, okay. The last authority structure is about the civil government. Oh. Like, remember, as a 
like being a christian uh being as a believer and uh, being in corporate sectors is not easy especially when we take stand uh, people will go through abuse or uh, they will be humiliated and uh, sometimes purposely the boss who is uh, over they purposely uh, abuse them purposely uh, ask them to work over time more than and uh, purposely can being so partial to them so how we can uh, deal that situation with so how do we deal in those situations um uh, well i have a younger sister who works in the corporate and in a, in in a strategic place of responsibility and i she's very very zealous and jealous of the god that she serves and you know um just follows kingdom principles and what the bible says at the workplace for her no is no yes is yes uh, even if it's a high official and authority in the workplace she will just have to say what is you know the biblical standard and what is right and she will just do it and she will not adhere to any of those the sons i've i've seen her do that and she has faced a lot of challenges but we've also seen the way god has brought her through uh those challenges and made her victorious and and given her victory and um, you know yes so it has been challenging not only in the workplace but also in the in the career courses when she stayed in hostel in manipal and all of those things um you know how she stood up for god and um how she was made fun of and mocked and everything but has made her more strong in the lord but also seen how god has come through for her it's not been easy it has been very challenging has been very difficult but uh, we know that god comes through and sometimes he does not come through immediately uh, you know it takes time it takes patience um, maybe you work for couple of months or even years where you don't receive anything but then ultimately god honors he yeah he does yes and uh, sometimes uh, and of course sorry he gives you the grace and the mercy to go through it and it's difficult but he does yes so, uh, and also uh, my question is that okay like where in sometimes uh, who are working because of the pressure and because of the authority over them they were forced to do uh, something against the standards of bible like if they want to uh, approve something that was very uh, uh, illegal or that is very opposite like uh, and uh, even if they don't want to do because of the pressure of the authorities over them they have to give an approval like some uh, situations comes like that right and uh, so uh, uh we have to be accountable for those uh, things that we do. yes you have to be because if you are saying hey i'm going to sign that illegal contract i'm going to do something illegal tomorrow you're going to get caught you're not going to it's not going to be under cover right it's going to come to the open it's something illegal you can't do that against a company it's 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 totally unethical to do that you know and it's and don't you don't don't think that people are blind they won't be able to see they will be able to see it you will uh, get caught you will face the circumstances you will go to the shame so you know when you know it's it's not right and it's wrong you can just say no i can't do it and if you can't do it and they say you have to leave you leave it's not that god is not is going to abandon you and he is not going to open another door for you he will open another door for you rather than sign that and then get into a whole lot of mess and trouble where god cannot you have to face the consequences for your sin yes any other questions okay lastly we'll talk about civil government okay god's authority structure in the civil government now we are living in two governments what are the two governments we are living in government of the land and the kingdom of god okay so the kingdom of god and we are directly under the government of god and we are and also under the government of this of the of the land that we are staying in the state government or the civil government and so we need to learn to relate correctly to the civil government look at what um, matthew chapter 22 verse 18 says where the pharisees you know they came to jesus and they wanted to catch him and they gave him a very tricky question and they knew that if he says either one of the ways they can easily catch him he can be tricked and they can get him into um 
trouble okay so let, let, let's look at what jesus says in matthew chapter 22 verses 18 to 22 can somebody read that please to 22 18 to 22 Yes. So what does Jesus say? He says, bring that coin. Whose image is on that coin? Caesar's. And he says, he makes an amazing statement. He says, which you and I are familiar, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. And he says, give to God what belongs to God. It's very simple. Yes. Very simple. He says, the coin has the image of Caesar. So give it to him, which means he's saying, pay your taxes and he says you are made in the image of god so you belong to god so give to god your own self okay so what is the main point that jesus is getting across here that we must respect even the civil government and he's saying you have to pay your taxes do whatever the nation uh, or the government of the nation requires you to do Okay, now Paul explains this to us in Romans chapter 13, verses 7, uh, verses 1 through 7, or verses 2 to 7. Can somebody read that, please? Romans chapter 13, verses 2 to 7. Romans chapter 13. So, anyone who rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted and they will be punished for the authority do not strike fear in people who are doing right but in those who are doing wrong would you like to live without fear of the authorities do what is right and they will honor you the authorities are god's servants sent for your good but if you are doing wrong of course you should be afraid for they have the power to punish you they are god's servants sent for the very purpose of punishing those who do what is wrong. So you must submit to them, not only to avoid punishment, but also to keep a clear conscience. Pay your taxes too. For these same reasons, for these same reasons, for government workers need to be paid. They are serving God in what they do. Give to everyone what you owe them. Pay your taxes and government fees to those who collect them. And give respect and honor to those who are in authority. Amen. So it says here, let every soul be subject to, to whom? The governing authorities. That means we need to be subject to the government that God has placed. For there is no authority except from God. And the authorities of the government that exists in our world are appointed by whom? God. Okay. So the government that is in our country, it's in our state, is appointed by whom? By God. Okay. So the government that you are under is appointed by God. So we must look at our government, whether it's in the state government or whether it's a central government, as those who are appointed by God. But you can ask, what if they're abusive? What if they don't make the right kind of choices, the right kind of decisions? What if they're wasting our money what if they do all kind of wrong things okay so what do they make the wrong decisions well that is their responsibility but what is our responsibility we have to obey them we have to be under them uh, we have to pay our taxes because god has appointed them we need to see them as who god has appointed and God in his own way is will be able to work in and through the government. God in his own way will be able to release his influence in and through our government. But 
in the God, authority structure that God has placed in our lives, our responsibility is to respect to them, to obey the law of the land, and to pay our taxes. Okay. Now, verses 3 says that those who resist the authority resist the ordinances of God. Are you all following? Verse 3 says, though whoever resists authority, resists the authority or the ordinances of God. Which means if you're going to fight against the government, you're fighting against whom? God. And those who resist will be brought to judgment and punishment. They will bring judgment upon themselves. Okay. Note verse 4. What is he calling the government as? God's servants, God's ministers. Can you imagine that he's calling the government as God's servants or God's ministers? Okay. And so he's saying there's a right way to relate to them. There's a right way to give them respect, to give them honor to those who are in the government. So, you know, you can ask, what if I don't like them? What if the party that I did not vote for, you know, is a ruling? Okay, whether you like them, you don't like them, whether you voted for them, whether you did not vote for them, you know, none of them holds good. Why? Because we have to give them the honor, we rightly relate to them, we pay our taxes, we give them respect, we submit ourselves to whatever rule and law. Okay, when you rightly do that, you are receiving God's government into your own life, and what will happen? God will honor you. Okay. Now, understand that we live under two governments, you know, and there might be situations where probably, you know, um, the government of the land contradicts the government of God. Okay. Sometimes the government of the land will contradict the government of God. What do you do in those cases? You obey the government of God. Okay, so in those cases, you have the full freedom to violate the government of man and submit to the government of God. Okay, let's look at an example in Acts chapter 4, okay, um, where Peter and John are caught and brought before the Sanhedrin. And what does the Sanhedrin say? We commanded you not to preach and teach in the name of Jesus. Okay, so that was the government of man. What does Peter respond? Verse 19 of chapter 4. What does Peter say? Can you please pass the mic? Um, yeah, thank you. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God you judge, for we cannot speak but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So it says, which is more right? Should we obey God or should we obey man? Okay, so what is the answer there? You have to obey God. Okay, so in the situation like Acts chapter 4, you know, it says, listen, Paul is saying our obligation is to follow the government of God. And his government says, tells us to go and preach the gospel to every creature and to everyone. So Paul, Peter and John are saying we're commissioned to do this. So in situations like this, we submit ourselves to the government of God and we have the freedom to violate the government of man. Okay. But in all other cases, in all other circumstances, we submit ourselves to government that is in place or the civil government that God has put into place. Now, I want us to understand uh, something that the kingdom of God is very different from the government of this world. Okay. You know, because some of us will ask, you know, what form of government is right? Whether uh, democracy, a government, a democratic government is right uh, or a monarch government is right. What kind of government is right? So you can say, hey, I don't want a democratic government because I follow what the Bible says. The Bible had things. So I will follow a monarchic kind of a government. Okay. But... You know, um, you know, we can argue about these different kinds of governments, these different kind of systems. But what you and I must understand first of all, that in the kingdom of God, it is very totally different. Okay. In the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God is a democratic government or a monarchic government. Or what kind of government it is? The kingdom of God. 
Monarchic? He's a king. It's theocracy. Okay, it's a government that is theocratic. Okay, theocracy government, which means God says and it is done. No questions asked. Full stop. God says it is done and no questions asked. Okay. Now, we in our democratic mindset want to bring democracy into the kingdom of God. Okay. And uh, we, God says something, but we want to vote on what he says. Sorry, that doesn't happen in the kingdom of God. It's a, a government of theocracy. Okay. There's theocracy in God's government. And whatever he says, we follow and nobody votes for it or against it. So in the kingdom of God, it is slightly different from our world. Okay. So regardless of the form of government, we have, you know, um, whatever, whether it's democratic or whether it's monarchic, uh, we need to understand a few things that God's government in the kingdom of God, it is a theocratic government, theocracy. Okay, so some of the things that we need to understand, the first thing is God is able to work in spite of who is in authority. God is able to work in spite of whoever is in leadership position or in the government. He's able to do what he wants to do. He is able to get done what he's, he has planned and preordained even before the foundations of the world and is able to get his purposes accomplished. So that's the first thing we need to understand. Because remember, we started off this lesson by saying that God is king and he rules over the nations. Even in this world that we are living in, in this wicked fallen world, God's rule and reign is still flowing through, is still being administered, which means he is a theocratic son. Whatever he plans, whatever he does, whatever he wants accomplished will happen. He will just get it done. He will accomplish it irrespective of who is in authority. The second thing is that we as people in that nation under the government, you know, we have a responsibility. Okay. So what is our responsibility? Our responsibility is to extend our rights to allow or to permit us to vote or pray for the right people to come into authority. So we have to exercise our right. That's the second thing. Okay. Second thing is we need to exercise our right uh, to vote for the right government, for pray to pray in for a right government uh, to come into authority. And that is our responsibility okay so every nation receives the government it deserves okay i'll repeat that again every nation receives its government it deserves okay so what we have today the government in place is what we deserve either we prayed for it or we did not pray for it either we voted for it or we did not vote for it we got what we deserve which means we have the fruit of our own efforts okay so it's important for us as people of god that we need to invest our time and effort and pray and use ever whatever rights that we have in our nation to make sure that the right people come into position and right people come into place okay look at what proverbs chapter 29 verse 2 says what does proverbs chapter 29 verse 2 says can somebody read that please it says, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. Okay. So we have the responsibility to bring the right people into government. Okay. But regardless of who the who is in government, God is able to bring his influence in and through them. Okay. Now I'll give you an example. Uh, Jesus stood before Pilate. We re read this in John chapter 19, verses 10 and 11. And uh, look at what Pilate said to uh, Jesus. Can somebody read that, please? John chapter 19, verses 10 and 11. Chapter 19, verses 10 and 11. Then Pilate said to him, Are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have power to crucify you and power to release you? Jesus answered, You could have no power at all against me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you as the greater sin. Amen. So here, um, you know, Pilate says, hey, Jesus, listen, you know, I'm in charge here. I have the authority. 
I can get you crucified or I can get you released. But how does Jesus respond to this? He says, no power has given to you against me unless it's given to you from above. Okay. So what is Jesus really saying? He's saying, Pilate, I recognize that you are in the place where you are in the leadership position because God above has allowed that and I respect it. So Jesus was not speaking anything demeaning to the pilot. He was not uh, putting him down or he was not challenging his authority. Uh, but he says, you know, where you are is because God has allowed you. And then he says, you know, Pilate, regardless of your decision, <coughs> sorry, so regardless of your decision, I'm just like paraphrasing it. it, says regardless of the decision you make, it will not be held, you will not be held responsible for your own, uh, for the sin that you are doing, because the people who are responsible are the Pharisees and the high priests. Theirs is the greater sin because they have delivered me to you. Okay, So the ones that delivered me to you are in the greater sin. Okay. So here, what do we learn from this? You know, we must learn to look at governments in the same manner. We need to look at them as people whom God has allowed this. Okay. So we need to pray for those in authority. We need to pray for those in leadership in our civil government. Pray for them. And when we have the time and chance, you know, we also need to pray for righteous people to come in. And we need to use our rights to bring the right people in. Okay. And Proverbs chapter 21, verse 1 says, can somebody read that? Proverbs chapter 21, verse 1. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. Like the rivers of water, he turns it, he turns it wherever he wishes. So the king's heart, the heart of the ruler, the heart of the governor, the heart of the person who is in authority, who is in leadership, is in the hand of whom? God. Regardless of who he is, doesn't matter. God can influence him. God can move him to do what he wants to be done. Okay, so let's look at some examples from the Bible. Can you think of any example? Genesis, Pharaoh, yes. You know, God says his heart was hardened, but in irrespective of that, God demonstrated more and more signs and miracles. And what happened? The people were ultimately absolutely convinced that they must follow this God who is fighting for them and who is doing these amazing miracles, who is all out to deliver them out of Egypt. So that is why when God told them, told Moses, tell the people to pack their bags, oops, to pack their bags, is it okay? Uh, to pack their bags and to leave that night, what happened? What happened? There was no questions asked. The people of Israel, the Hebrew people, just followed God. Okay? So they just packed and they left. Okay? And so we see that even that turned out to for God's advantage. Okay? So think about Nehemiah. Okay, Nehemiah is in the palace. He's a comparer to the king. And what happens? This is a Persian king. And Nehemiah is grieved over the broken walls of Jerusalem. He wants to go and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And what does this unsaved king tell him? The unsaved king, you know, gives favor to Nehemiah. Not only gives him a paid vacation, gives him letters, gives him material to build the walls, even sends an escort to ensure his safety. Okay. So we see that the heathen king is doing all this. And who you think is working in his heart? It is God who is working in his heart. And even to the extent where he allows the, the Jewish people to go back to Jerusalem and he says, hey, go back, rebuild your city, be happy and live in that. So we see that God can move through our governments regardless of who they are. Okay. Now we take this and apply it to every other authority and structure that you and I face in life, whether it is our family, whether you are parents, whether you are children, whether you belong to a local church, you're part of the body of Christ, or whether you're in a workplace, 
or you're under a civil government, we apply the same pr uh, principle. What is the principle we apply regardless of who is there, regardless of what kind of people they are, you know, we need to relate to them rightly. Why should we relate to them rightly when we do that? We receive God's working in your life and God's blessing and God is able to do it. But what is your responsibility and my responsibility? We give honor to whom honor is due. Okay. Our responsibility is to recognize that God has allowed them to be in that place, in that position, in that rank for whatever reason, whether it's your boss, whether it's your parents, whether it's, uh, you know, your pastor, whoever, whatever reason. And just like Jesus standing before the pilot, you need to say, I know because God has allowed this. And because God has allowed this, I am coming into subjection under respect, under honor, under you. Okay. So God's government comes into our lives through these authority structures that you and I are part of. And if we relate to it rightly, we receive his kingdom that comes into our lives. And also we receive his blessing and his government increases in and through us. Okay. But if you fail, there are consequences, right? If the head of the home, you know, fails to fulfill his responsibility, fails to, to love his wife, fails to be compassionate and gracious and merciful to his wife, fails to respect his wife as a weaker vessel, what happens? The serious consequences at home. If, um, if uh, the, the woman in the house is not submissive, the serious consequences. Now, when there are serious consequences, what happens? The alarm bell rings. Everyone wants help. They cry out for help. See? So what you can do is when they come to help, like Nina Santosh was asking, what do you do? When they come to you for help, they're desperate for answers. That time you need to show them the biblical principle. That time you need to tell them, hey, God's authority structure that he's placed in the home, his government structure he's placed in the home is not being followed. If you put this into place, you will see God's blessing flowing into your family. Okay. And then we know people will do anything and everything to just receive God's blessing. They will have to fall into place. Okay. So um, now the same thing, when you know, think of civil government, when the civil government fails, what happens to the state? What happens to the nation? You know, there's total shutdown of, you know, there'll be problem and chaos and internal fightings. The same thing happens at home. So as the head of the home, if the person in responsibility fails, there'll be utter chaos at home. Why? Because God's government is not able to come into your home. Okay. So husbands have to take their place of responsibility. Wives have to follow. Children have to follow. The same thing in the local uh, church. The same thing in the workplace. Same thing in the body of Christ. Okay. So some of us are in places of authority in these structures, government structures that God has placed. You know, what do we need to do? We need to take it very, very seriously. Okay. It's a responsibility that God has given to us. We must do it well. You know, when people under us will rejoice, you know, and celebrate and be happy. If we as people in responsibility do what is right, you know, uh, if when we follow God's government, people under us will be blessed. And when we follow God's structure and government in the church, in the family, in the body of Christ, people will also want to follow this. So sometimes people in church don't want to follow God's government structure because they see the pastor himself not doing that with his own family or in the church. The pastor doesn't do it. Why should I do it? Right? So if we abuse our position, then people will suffer and everything goes into total chaos and disorder. And then we see that God's blessings does not flow through and his kingdom his kingdom rule, his kingdom reign, his kingdom mandate does not flow through our family or to the church or the body of Christ, the local church or the body of Christ or in the workplace. That is why there'll be more frustration, disappointment and everything that happens. Okay. We just have one more minute. Uh, we finished this lesson. So anyone has any questions? Yes. You had a question quickly. It's a long question. You want to ask next uh, week? Okay. Anyone has any has any questions?
Okay, if you have any, um, Anand has a question. He says a long question, so he'll ask us next week. Doesn't matter. Okay, thank you all for joining class. I, I'm extremely sorry and apologize for the 11 minutes of delay that we had today. I'm really very sorry. We tried to fix things at uh, at 8 o'clock when I came in, but uh, it didn't work out. I'm just so sorry. Okay, everyone have a good week and a good day. God bless you. Thank you for joining class.